as light glimmers again on the horizon, our hearts should be filled with gratitude for those who helped to guide us through the darkest days. And I want to extend that gratitude to the Scottish Parliament itself, because another virus has ravaged the world this year, the virus of political authoritarianism. We have watched regime after regime fall to dictators who killed the life of freedom. The philosopher Isaiah Berlin said that the main challenge that faced the human community was that our disagreements were rarely between an obvious good and an obvious evil. They were usually between rival versions of the good. Democracy was hard because it was built not on the suppression of disagreement, but on allowing it to flourish. You keep that principle alive and well in the Scottish Parliament. Your passionately argued disagreements keep us free. And for that, we should also be grateful. So, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Dr Holloway. Now, the next item of business is consideration of business motion 24452 in the name of Graeme Day on behalf of the Bureau setting out changes to this week's business. Could I call on the Minister to move the motion? Move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. Uh, no member has indicated they wish to speak on the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 24452 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I just uh, note, colleagues, that we've just added the motion of no confidence. That we'll, I will take the vote on the motion of no confidence immediately following the debate. And there'll be a five minute division when I call that vote. So that'll be around five past four this afternoon. Now the next item is a statement from the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, on COVID-19 reflections and next steps. I would encourage all members who wish to contribute to press their request to speak buttons. And I call on the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, presiding officer, this will be my final full parliamentary statement on COVID before Parliament rises for the election. And of course, as Richard Holloway has just noted in his thoughtful and moving remarks, today marks exactly one year since the country first entered lockdown. A year ago today, we all felt scared and uncertain. We did not know exactly what lay ahead or how long it might last. But we did know we had to come together to save lives. And I know I will never be able to adequately express the depths of my gratitude for all the sacrifices that have been made by so many over the past year. Today, I want to reflect on the anxiety, isolation, loss and grief that have marked the past 12 months. But I also want to acknowledge the compassion, solidarity and love that has brought hope and light to these darkest of times. Before I do any of that, though, I will, as usual, give an update on today's figures. Uh, the total number of positive cases reported yesterday was 495. That is 3.6% of all the tests carried out and takes the total number of cases now to 214,383. As of this morning, 2,214,672 people had received a first dose of vaccine. And that is almost half of the whole adult population of Scotland. So we are approaching a very important milestone. Uh, we remain on course to offer first doses to the nine priority GCVI groups, uh, which is everyone over 50, all unpaid carers and all adults with particular underlying health conditions by mid-April. I can also report that 341 people are currently in hospital, which is 12 fewer than yesterday, and 28 people are receiving intensive care, which is five fewer than yesterday. But I regret to report that in the past 24 hours, a further seven deaths were registered of patients who first tested positive in the previous 28 days. The total number of deaths under this measurement is now 7,559. Tomorrow, however, National Records of Scotland will publish its weekly update, which uses a wider definition, and that will show that almost 10,000 people in Scotland have now died of COVID. Every single one of those deaths is, of course, a tragedy. Each one has left a gaping hole in the lives of the people who loved them. And yet again today, I want to pass on my condolences to all those who are grieving. Yesterday, I met with representatives of families bereaved as a result of COVID, and I want to pay tribute to their strength and resolve. In that discussion, I acknowledged, as I have done before, that the Scottish Government did not get everything right in our response to the pandemic. I don't think any government did. 
It is vital that we reflect on that and that we learn lessons from that, which is why I also confirmed that establishing a statutory public inquiry will be a priority for this government if we are returned at the election. Returning, though, to this sad anniversary, today has been designated a national day of reflection, and I know many people will be thinking about those we have lost during the year, whatever the cause of their death. Earlier today, I stood with others to observe a minute silence. That silence was, I know, observed by many thousands across the country. Later this evening, Scottish government premises and many other public buildings across the country will be lit up in yellow. The Scottish Government is also helping to fund the creation of a national memorial garden in Pollock Park in Glasgow as part of an initiative led by the Herald newspaper. And we have also confirmed today that we will support COVID community memorial projects in locations across the country. Artists from Green Space Scotland will work with community groups, faith groups and those hit hardest by the pandemic to develop projects such as commemorative gardens, memorials and public artworks. These acts of collective remembrance are especially important because one of the cruelest aspects of this pandemic has undoubtedly been its impact on our ability to grieve. It is, of course, a natural human response when someone we love dies to gather together with others to mourn our loss and to celebrate their life. The fact that this shared and important ritual has not been possible has I know been an additional source of grief for many during this most difficult of years. So I hope that today's day of reflection and the memorials that communities will plan will help. They are a way in which we can begin to pay those we have lost the tribute that they deserve. Of course, today is also a time to mark the sacrifices that so many people have made over the past 12 months. Many of us, I know, will be thinking especially today about our health and care workers. We've been reminded once again just how much we owe to their dedication, expertise and compassion. And I am acutely aware that no words of thanks can ever be sufficient for the service that has been given over the past year. But I'm sure I speak for everyone, not just in Parliament, but across the country, in stressing again how deeply grateful we are for everything they have done and indeed continue to do. Other public servants have also played a crucial role. Our police officers and their support staff have enforced tough restrictions proportionately and sensitively. Our teachers and all those who work in schools have done an outstanding job in difficult and regularly changing circumstances. Other local authority staff too have provided vital help and support to those who most need it. And in some cases, for example, the speed with which they help to protect homeless people, they've provided us with really valuable lessons for the future. I also want to pay tribute today to Scotland's diverse business community. Many companies have met specific needs relating to the pandemic. At the start of the pandemic, for example, some distilleries started making hand sanitizer. We've also been able to develop a PPE supply chain in Scotland, which did not exist before the start of the pandemic. And virtually all companies have gone to immense efforts to create safe conditions for staff and customers. Uh, they have supported home working for employers, employees, complied with regulations which have often stopped them trading normally. And they've shown a sense of social responsibility through all of the concerns that have been faced about their own businesses. Now, the Scottish Government has and will continue to do everything we can to support the business sector. But I know that this has been the most difficult year that many employers and their workforces have ever faced. And again, I'm immensely grateful for all of those efforts. I'm also grateful to Scotland's faith groups who have helped their communities and found new ways of reaching out to their followers. I'm pleased to confirm today that from Friday, collective worship will again be permitted in groups of up to 50 if the premises can support such a gathering with appropriate physical distancing. This is an important change and I hope that it will be especially welcomed as we head towards important religious festivals over the next few weeks. Community groups and third sector organisations have also rallied round, helped by the support of hundreds of thousands of people across the country. In fact, the great outpouring of community spirit that we have seen has really been a source of light in an otherwise dark year. Last March, when we launched the Scotland Cares website to help find roles for people who wanted to volunteer, that site received more than 80,000 sign-ups. And of course, there are many more people who might never have registered formally as volunteers 
but who have gone out of their way to support others, helping out with shopping, calling on friends and neighbours who needed company, providing essential care for those in need. I think all of us have really struggled in the past year with the paradox that this virus has created. We've had to stay physically apart from each other, from those we love most, at a time when we have never needed each other more. None of us, though, should be surprised that this year it has been filled with difficulty and anxiety and for too many people with grief. But I think we can and should also take some heart from the extent to which it has also been filled with compassion and love. And that is true also of one of the most important ways in which we have all tried to look after each other. By sticking to incredibly tough rules and restrictions, all of us have helped to save lives. We have helped to keep this virus under control. And we've helped to create the situation we are now in, where we can start to plan a route out of lockdown. Uh, the final point I want to make here today about our collective efforts during the past year is directed towards our young people. For children, uh, if there are any children watching this, which I, I doubt, um, I know how difficult it has been for you to spend time out of school and to have such strict restrictions placed on how and when you can see your friends. But you have been truly magnificent during these strange and worrying times. You've stuck to the rules, you've done your homeschooling, I'm sure, most of the time, and you've helped out your parents and carers. And everybody across the country is incredibly proud of you. Uh, thank you for everything you have done. I also want to acknowledge the impact of the past year on young adults. Uh, many young people have been furloughed, uh, many have lost their jobs. Anyone who has been studying at college or university has had significant restrictions placed on how they study and in some cases where they live at one of the most formative times uh, of any young person's life. And although the restrictions on socialising are difficult for all of us, they are especially tough for people in their late teens and early 20s. But by sticking to the rules, as the vast majority have done, you have protected yourselves, but also helped to protect older adults. And I hugely appreciate that, as does the entire country. Presiding officer, for all these reasons, uh, one of my overwhelming emotions on looking back over the last year, which is why Richard Holloway's remarks resonated so strongly, uh, is gratitude. Um, I will never be able to thank people enough for the sacrifices made and everything that has been endured over these past 12 months. But in addition to gratitude, I think all of us should feel a sense of resolve, perhaps politicians in particular. As we recover from this pandemic, as we will, we must create a better and a fairer country for everyone. The way in which people have responded to the pandemic has been defined, as I've said, by solidarity, compassion, love and sacrifice. But the way in which people have been affected has been defined by the inequalities that still scar our society. Inequality has massively affected people's quality of life during lockdown. And of course, deprivation has significantly increased some people's chances of getting COVID and of dying from it. None of us can be satisfied by the idea of returning to life exactly as it was before. That's why, for example, the Scottish Young Persons Guarantee makes it clear that our young people must not pay the price of this pandemic throughout their lives. All of them must get a fair shot at education, employment or training as they start out in life. It's also why we are working to establish a new national care service. The last year has powerfully reminded us of the importance of care and of the dedication of our care workers. But the death toll in care homes has been a national tragedy. We must consider, reconsider and reimagine how we support our care workers and look after our older citizens. We must also learn other lessons from this pandemic. And that does include reflecting on our mistakes, the timing of the first lockdown, the decision to ease travel restrictions during last summer. But it also includes ensuring that we are prepared for future public health emergencies too. And more generally, there is, I think, a lesson for all of us in never ever seeing any change that we want to make as unthinkable or unachievable. The past 12 months have shown us that when it's necessary, human beings can achieve quite incredible and extraordinary things. Scientists across the globe have developed vaccines at record speeds. Testing infrastructures have been established literally from scratch. 
People have changed their behaviour and their way of life at a moment's notice to protect and care for each other. Now, the conditions that the next Scottish Parliament faces will, I hope, be nothing, nothing like the ones we've encountered and endured in the past year. But that Parliament will have an even greater responsibility than this and previous ones to tackle inequality, to support economic recovery and achieve a just transition to a net zero society. And if we, all of us, can summon just some of the urgency, resolve and solidarity we have shown in the face of the virus and bring that to bear in tackling these big issues and others, then I hope we can ensure that we don't simply return to normal, that instead we create a better and fairer normality for the future. Presiding officer, these choices, of course, will be for the next parliament and the next government. For today, I know the focus for everyone is on remembrance and reflection. But since this is the last time that I will speak about COVID in this chamber before the election, I do want to say a few words about the weeks ahead. COVID updates will obviously be much less regular during the pre-election period, but the government will still be monitoring the pandemic constantly. I will be doing so on a daily basis and taking and announcing decisions as required. That's vital because although we can now see a route out of lockdown, difficult judgments do continue to lie ahead. In the past three months, we've significantly reduced the number of COVID cases in Scotland. We know that the vaccination programme is now reducing deaths and recent research gives us confidence that vaccination will reduce transmission rates. That opens up the prospect, uh, the fantastic prospect that we can come out of lockdown on a sustainable basis. Indeed, I can confirm that from 6pm tomorrow, the Western Isles will move from level four restrictions to level three, the level that currently applies to Orkney and Shetland and some of Scotland's other islands. And that reflects their success in reducing transmission in recent weeks. Across the country, during April, we hope to reopen parts of the economy with more retail services reopening on 5th April and a full reopening of shops on the 26th. We hope that hospitality will start to reopen on the 26th of April as well and that travel restrictions in mainland Scotland will come to an end on the same date. And of course, above all, we hope to see all children back in school after the Easter holidays. And of course, we also look forward to it becoming easier for all of us to meet up with each other again, particularly loved ones, initially in outdoor settings, but then we hope indoors as well. As vaccination proceeds and we go further into spring, life should feel a bit less restricted and a bit more hopeful than perhaps it has done for some time. And as a higher and higher proportion of the population gets their first dose of vaccine, we hope to be able to relax restrictions even more. As I indicated last week, we have real hope that later on this year that gigs can be allowed again, nightclubs can reopen, social gatherings can be permitted and family re re reunions can take place so that we can all enjoy simple pleasures such as hugging our loved ones, pleasures that I'm sure none of us will ever take quite as much for granted again. But although that point may be in sight, that end is not quite here yet. At the moment, hundreds of people are still getting this virus every day in Scotland. It is still highly infectious and it is still dangerous, including to many younger people. And of course, many countries across Europe appear now to be on the brink of a third wave. All of that should remind us of the need to be careful and cautious. As we emerge from lockdown, we must do so steadily and surely, and in a way that does not allow the virus to run out of control. And we must keep in place other measures, for example, travel restrictions for as long as they are needed. <clears throat> to lift restrictions in the future, we still need to keep suppressing the virus now. So please, uh, to everyone across the country, continue to stay within the rules uh, for your own safety and the safety of everyone else. Stay at home for now, except for specific essential purposes. Please do not meet people from other households indoors. And remember to follow the facts advice when you are out and about. By doing this over the past 12 months, all of us have helped each other get through what has been, I think for all of us, certainly for the majority of us, the most difficult, challenging and exhausting year of our lives. By continuing to do all of this in the coming weeks, we can and will continue to look after each other. And we can also start to look ahead to the future, not just in hope, but with increasing expectation of the better and brighter days that lie ahead. 
Uh, my sincere thanks to everyone across the country for all the sacrifices of the past 12 months. Thank you very much, First Minister. We will move to questions. Ruth Davidson. Presenting officer, I was proud to join you and the other party leaders for the day of reflection and the minute silence at noon today as we remembered all those who have lost their life to COVID. But I was struck beforehand to read of a man who wanted his son remembered today too. Ross McCarthy was 31 when he took his own life during the restrictions and his family are raising money for the CAM charity. Today of all days, we remember that COVID, yes, has taken many lives, far too many lives, but it has also taken a huge toll even on those who have not contracted the condition. And I echo the words of Dr Richard Holloway in his gratitude to all those doctors and nurses and bin collectors and shop workers who've kept us going over the past year. Presenting officer, we support the continuing efforts of the vaccination teams across the country and 2.2 million first doses is a real achievement. However, a newspaper report today revealed that last week one in seven vaccine appointments were missed because of delays in delivering the letters. The delay impacted around 60,000 people and for that reason the central vaccine target was missed. A Scottish Government spokesman said that this issue was later resolved and they added that they were still establishing whether it was a localised issue or more widespread. We are pleased to note that the vaccine rollout is still powering ahead. But can I ask the First Minister to clarify whether the issue was localised or whether it was countrywide? Uh, for those people who missed appointments, have they been contacted again and when can they expect a new date for their JAG? And if anybody is understandably worried uh, that they've missed their chance, where can they go for information and reassurance? First Minister. Well, can I uh, say, first of all, as I have done already today, that I think not only uh, of those who lost their lives to COVID over the past year and to their uh, grieving families, but to everyone whose lives have been lost over the past year um, and those uh, who are missing them uh, and grieving them. Uh, this last year and all of the difficulties and challenges that has thrown up has affected people in a whole multitude of ways and it is important that we reflect on that today uh, and remember all of that. Um, the vaccination programme is uh, progressing extremely well. If I cast my mind back to the turn of this year, I was optimistic about the speed and the scale of the rollout of vaccination, but I uh, would, I think, have been sceptical uh, if you had told me then that we would have reached quite so many people as we have now. So I want to put on record today my thanks to everybody uh, in the central team, but all of the vaccinators and teams across the country who are responsible for that success. Uh, when we implement a programme of this scale and at this speed, uh, it is inevitable, unfortunately, that there will be glitches and things that do not go as well as we want. And that is true of the scheduling, printing and posting uh, of letters uh, associated with the programme. Uh, we are aware of issues with the delivery of appointment letters in the early part of last week. We are still trying uh, with National Services Scotland and Royal Mail to understand all of the detail of that, uh, but I have been given an assurance that the issue has been resolved. I want to apologise to anybody affected. Uh, there were uh, around 60,000 appointments last week that were not attended. Uh, we are closely monitoring day-to-day -day uptake versus projections um, and trying to make sure that we understand the reasons why people may not be attending for uh, appointment. Uh, undoubtedly, last week, that would have been partly down to the issue with letters, uh, but there will also be other issues. We, for example, were concerned last week, although I think those concerns have not materialised uh, about the publicity around the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine and the impact that might have. And we're working on these issues all of the time to make sure people are coming forward for appointments and are being supported to do so. In terms of rebooking, the, the process to rebook any appointments that weren't attended last week is underway and that will be done as quickly as possible. And of course, people are able to telephone uh, the helpline on 0800 030 8013 if they have any issues uh, that they wish advice or support on. Thank you. And I saw a word to be followed by Willie Rennie. <clears throat> Presenting officer, a year since Scotland uh, went into the first lockdown, almost 10,000 of our fellow Scots have lost their lives and my thoughts are with all their families. This past year has been tough for us all. We have been distant from loved ones, unable to share good moments, but hardest of all, unable to grieve together. We are all indebted to those heroes on the front line who have helped save lives and those who kept our country running. There is finally some hope and we will get through this. 
Can I share the comments made by both uh, Ruth Davidson and the First Minister to send gratitude to all our citizens across the country for their sacrifices? Uh, we can't return back to normal after this pandemic. Uh, I hope we are all united on that. While there is optimism and hope again, there is a creeping rise in cases in some parts of Scotland, and we must avoid a potential third wave. Our test and protect system will be absolutely crucial to that. So does the First Minister have confidence that test and protect finally is robust enough to avoid another lockdown? First Minister. Uh, test and protect is robust and has been uh, robust since it was established. And test and protect has uh, played a vital role in trying to uh, break chains of transmission, minimise the spread of the virus, and uh, undoubtedly will have helped to save uh, a large number of people from contracting the virus and, as part of that, will have saved lives. Uh, and I'm grateful to everybody working across that system. Uh, Test and Protect is a vital part of our defence and our response, but as I have said all along, uh, it is not our first line of defence uh, against the virus. The first line of defence against the virus is still all of us in the precautions and mitigations that we are being asked to take. And increasingly, of course, uh, the most important important line of defence against the virus is the vaccination programme. Uh, Test and Protect is there. It does a good job. It will do a good job. We will support it with the resources it needs uh, to operate at the level that is required. But all of us will help Test and Protect if, for uh, the time being, we continue uh, to abide by all of the rules and restrictions and make sure that we're playing our part, just as everybody has uh, done so well over the past 12 months in keeping the virus under control. This is above all else and has been uh, every day of the last 12 months a collective effort. We all have our part to play and each one of us must continue to play that part as we steer our way through and hopefully soon out of this. Nobody wants to go backwards uh, but we should look across Europe right now with uh, concern at what is happening there. Vaccination rates are obviously higher across the UK than in many other European countries but nevertheless that third wave looks to be starting again and we cannot be complacent about that here. This is and remains an infectious virus so we have to be cautious and we have to take all of those precautions. If we continue to do that I remain, as I said last week, hopeful that we might be on that final straight back to normality but the worst thing we could do is entertain any complacency about that and I hope and expect that nobody will do so. Thank you. Willie Rennie to be followed by Alison Johnson. It, it was the little things, the things we took for granted, that I think we now miss most. Hugging your mum, walking in the mountains, coffee mornings and my wife's Zumba class. It, the fabric it, of a liberal society has been locked up in a cupboard, but there was pain too. The long-awaited hip operation or the cancer not detected until it's too late. The freedom provided by our National Health Service has been rolled back and the tragedy of thousands of people no longer in our lives. Something must good, must good, good must come from these dark days. Social care workers have been undervalued for years, but they did not waver when we needed them most. Does the First Minister agree with me that it is time to pay our social care workers the wages they deserve? First Minister. Well, everybody will have uh, lots of things they miss and are desperate to get back to. Uh, I, I know for me, hugging my mum is probably the thing I miss most of all right now and look forward to uh, most of all. Um, social care workers have gone above and beyond uh, the call of duty over the past year, as have those working in our National Health Service. Um, I can't even begin to imagine how difficult, traumatic uh, and challenging on a day-to-day -day basis it must have been at the height of the first wave to be caring for older people in one of our care homes and uh, we talk about gratitude I've done so today and I you know regularly say things that I can never find the words but genuinely here I can't find the words because uh, what we asked of our care workers and what they gave was truly exceptional yes I do think it's time to uh, pay care workers uh, what they deserve uh, when you're in government 
it's not just as easy as saying that. We have to work out what we mean by that and how we then deliver it through budgets uh, and through a policy programme. But with social care, I think it's time that we transform and reform uh, the way the whole system works. The National Care Service is an opportunity uh, to transform the quality of care for our older citizens, but also transform the way in which we value and remunerate those who work in it. And that's something I am uh, determined, should I be in a position to influence it in the next parliament, to drive forward as an absolute priority. Thank you. Alison Johnson to be followed by Alistair Allen. Thank you. On this National Day of Reflection, on behalf of the Scottish Green Party, I send my deepest sympathies to all who have lost a loved one in this most challenging of times, and particularly when our ability to grieve together has been so impacted. And my heartfelt thanks too to our health and care workers, to our teachers, our shop and postal staff, our bin collectors, our delivery drivers, and all those on the front line who have kept the country going. This week, the Prime Minister has said that a third wave of coronavirus that has hit mainland Europe will wash up on our shores. And I'd like to know if the First Minister shares his view, his acceptance that such an outcome is inevitable. And I'd like to understand what progress the Scottish Government has made in urging the UK Government to tighten border controls. First Minister. Well, let me make two points about uh, the prospects of a third wave. Uh, First is we cannot stand and guarantee that that will not happen here. This is an infectious virus um, and I think one of the things, one of the many things we've learned over the past 12 months is that uh, just wishing uh, away the virus or uh, hoping or saying that we don't want a, a further wave or a further lockdown doesn't bring any of these things into reality. We've got to act in a way that minimises uh, the chances of a third wave. That involves all of us doing things uh, domestically, making sure we are cautious as we come out of lockdown, making sure we continue to comply with rules and restrictions for as long as necessary. Uh, but the other point I would make is washing up on our shores it is not inevitable. One of my regrets uh, about uh, last year when I look back is that as we suppressed the virus so hard and successfully in Scotland, we opened up international travel uh, perhaps too quickly um, and uh, too, too much. Now, the reasons for doing that were not wrong. The industry was in dire straits and people wanted to be able to travel again. But I don't think on reflection and uh, in retrospect, that was the right thing to do. I'm determined we don't do that again. Importation of new cases and new variants of this virus is one of the biggest risks we face. Uh, we have continued uh, rules in place for managed quarantine of people coming in directly to Scotland. Those rules are not as restrictive in the rest of the UK, and I have tried very hard to persuade the UK to emulate our policy. They I do not wish to do that. That is their decision, um, and I cannot force it upon them. But it does leave us uh, with a greater vulnerability to importation than I would like us to have. I also think as we uh, approach uh, May and that mid-May point when the UK government has said they may re-allow international travel and we certainly said it won't be before that that we are cautious. I was heartened to hear uh, Michael Gove say on a call last week that it was by no means certain that international travel would be reopened then. I think we've got to be very, very cautious here and that's one of the things we'll continue to try to do on a Four Nations basis but take whatever decisions we can here to protect the public as much as possible. Thank you, Alistair Allen, to be followed by Maurice Golden. As we mark the anniversary of lockdown, I'm sure that the First Minister will wish to join me in paying tribute to people in Scotland's highlands who have gone so long, in many cases, without seeing family and friends elsewhere. So the news that the Western Isles are moving into level three uh, will be very welcome here. Can the First Minister say when decisions will be taken? on what this means for travel advice uh, for movement to and from the islands. First Minister. Um, as I said last week, we will have discussions with island authorities uh, over the next few weeks uh, to come to a view on uh, whether or not uh, island communities, when the rest of the country at the end of April hopefully comes down into level three, uh, our island communities want to stay there or, as the data would probably justify, go down to, to level two at that stage. Uh, the reason that is not as straightforward a decision as it may appear is that obviously if our islands are in a significantly lower level of restrictions with hospitality open more, then we need to protect islands from the possible importation of cases. So there may be a merit uh, in staying 
in a similar level of restrictions to allow travel for people to see loved ones, for example. So we will have those discussions and come to a conclusion on that over uh, the next few weeks. And of course, we will report that uh, as we uh, make and uh, announce the decision about whether we are moving forward, as I hope we will be, with the easing up of restrictions that I set out to Parliament last week. But I would take the opportunity to pay tribute to those in our island communities. Lockdown has been tough for everyone, but I, I guess it has been tougher for those who live uh, in more remote communities uh, with already uh, distances making it difficult to see loved ones, and this undoubtedly has exacerbated that already difficult situation. Thank you, Boris Golden, to be followed by Maureen Watt. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I have been contacted by a 65-year-old constituent with an underlying health condition who still hasn't had a vaccine. The options on the helpline do not allow for someone who is not on the list, rather only for rescheduling or for a missed appointment. My constituent has been going around in circles. I have contacted the Health Board, but will the First Minister agree to look into this matter? First Minister. Uh, if the member wants to send me the details of the constituent, uh, yes, of course I will look into it. I have made clear uh, that if people are finding they don't get the answers from the, the routes they should be getting answers from, their own GP or the helpline, uh, then they should contact my office. So if you send me the details, I will have that looked into. Thank you. Maureen Watt to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As we mark the year since the start of lockdown and restrictions, it's impossible to ignore the toll on people's mental health and on the subsequent demand for mental health services. Can the First Minister outline what plans the Scottish Government has to respond to this increase in demand? First Minister. Uh, the Mental Health Recovery Plan has already been set out by the Mental Health Minister. We've also announced uh, increases in funding and investment for uh, mental health, and we will continue uh, to respond appropriately uh, to the increased demand that is undoubtedly going to be there uh, for some time. Uh, the Mental health support, I think, is one of the many ways in which uh, the legacy of this pandemic will live uh, with us for a long time. And there is a, a real obligation on the part of government to make sure that we are responding appropriately. And it's a, a priority that we acknowledge uh, and are determined uh, to take extremely seriously. Um, can I take the opportunity, if this is uh, Maureen Watt's uh, last contribution in Parliament, as it may or may not be, to uh, wish her well in her uh, retirement. Maureen is a long-standing friend <laughs> and colleague of mine who has made an outstanding contribution to the Scottish Parliament, and she will be greatly missed by all of us. Thank you. Can I call Jackie Bailey to be followed by Bruce Clark? Businesses in my community have struggled during the pandemic and they've been grateful for rates relief. Many of us across the chamber asked for and welcomed the extension of relief for 21-22. But I'm told that businesses have until the 31st of March to apply or the relief may well be lost in the new year. The window to apply is effectively one week. Will the First Minister recognise that this is too short a time frame and allow some flexibility in the application period by at least a month so businesses do not lose out? First Minister. Well, firstly, I think we should all encourage uh, businesses, uh, as I think most businesses uh, do for obvious reasons, to apply timidly for the support uh, that is available so that that support can be uh, got to them as quickly as possible. We have uh, tried to be as flexible as possible with all of uh, these support schemes over the course of the pandemic, and I will raise the point uh, with the Finance Secretary, who I'm sure will reply in more detail. Thank you. Bruce Crawford, to be followed by Annie Wills. Thank you, President Officer. First Minister, travel restrictions have been a vital component in controlling the spread of COVID-19. I was very concerned, therefore, over the last weekend, constituents contacted me alarmed about the number of day visitors, motorcyclists and motorhomes appearing in places like Calendar. I also know the First Minister there there will come a time, hopefully not far off, that visitors will welcome, very welcome back to my fabulous Stirling constituency. However, in the meantime, a stay at home order remains in place and only from the 2nd of April does it become state local. Therefore, First Minister, what more can be done to strengthen the crucial messages around travel restrictions to allay the fears of my constituents and stop the spread of COVID? First Minister. Well, it's a really important point. I think all of us are frustrated uh, by the inability to travel across local authority boundaries to see loved ones. I, I know I feel that, and I, I think everybody does. So we look forward to the point where we can start to ease those travel restrictions across 
mainland Scotland. But right now, these restrictions are in place for a purpose, and I think it is incumbent on all of us to make sure that we articulate that message and urge people to abide by those restrictions. Right now, uh, we're asking that no one travels for any reason other than essential purposes and should stay within their own local authority area. Uh, as Bruce Crawford says, we hope to lift the current stay-at-home rule on the 2nd of April. Uh, Initially, though, although we hope for no more than three weeks, that stay at home will be replaced by guidance to stay local and a continued uh, legal requirement in level four areas for people not to travel outside their own local authority area unless for an allowed reason it will remain in place. We will be ensuring that our marketing and messaging emphasise this message, particularly over the forthcoming Easter holiday period, but it's important that we all take the opportunity to reinforce that. And in what may become a theme today, um, I suspect this is Bruce Crawford's last contribution uh, to this Parliament before he retires. Bruce has also been a valued colleague and a great friend of mine since I was a Wayne, uh, so I'm going to miss him. Uh, I'm going to miss him dearly. It's hard to imagine this Parliament without Bruce Crawford, uh, but uh, I wish him all uh, good wishes for his retirement, uh, and I look forward to seeing him in some campaign trail somewhere or other very soon. Thank you. Can I call Annie Wells to be followed by Annabel Ewing? Annie Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On this day of reflection, one year on since the first lockdown, I'd like to join others in remembering all of those who have lost loved ones to COVID-19. First Minister, I've been in contact with a concerned constituent who has informed me that they and their spouse, despite being over 65, have not yet received an appointment for their first dose of the vaccine. And after contacting NHS Inform, they were told they weren't on the central register and so they weren't invited for an appointment. This situation is obviously unacceptable, given it has caused unnecessary anxiety. Although the majority of the over 65-year-olds have received their first dose, can the First Minister explain what action the government is taking to ensure no more vulnerable people fall through the cracks? First question. Nobody is going to fall through the cracks. And, you know, I would ask Annie Wells, you know, to, to recognise that people are working really hard and delivering exceptional success in this vaccination programme. If people are waiting for appointments, it's not deliberate. It's not because people have wanted them to fall through the cracks. Some of the cases that have been sent to me directly, and this is not, uh, not an attempt to, to say it's anybody's fault, but it has often been uh, administrative problems that maybe somebody has recently changed GP and the address hasn't been updated and there's an explanation and when we are made aware of these cases we take the necessary steps to fix them and uh, that will be the case nobody is going to be left behind in this vaccination program uh, so again I would say to people uh, across the country who believe they should have had their vaccination appointment who haven't yet had it call the helpline call your own GP in extremists, if you're not getting the answers you want, uh, contact my office and we will try to resolve that. And to MSPs across the Chamber, um, particularly given that Parliament is uh, shortly going to rise for the election, uh, contact the Government if these issues are being raised uh, and we will do everything to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you. Annabel Ewing to be followed by Alec Rowley. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Many of my Cowden Beef constituents and indeed people across Scotland have relied on the First Minister leading us through the coronavirus pandemic and are very grateful to her for her unstinting work seven days a week, week in, week out, for over 12 months now. Can the First Minister therefore provide reassurance that notwithstanding the election campaign and in the run-up to polling day, she will continue to take daily uh, charge of the management of the pandemic and will be able to provide regular update briefings. First Minister. Uh, yes, I, I can give that assurance. Um, as First Minister, during a crisis, uh, notwithstanding the election campaign, and I will uh, respect and observe all of the uh, the, the, the requirements of an election campaign, it's important that that is uh, a level playing field. But as First Minister, I have a duty to make sure that I continue uh, to oversee and to manage uh, the response to the COVID pandemic because we are in a crisis and it requires uh, that direction. So that will have my daily attention and I will ensure uh, either from me or from uh, appropriate personnel that updates are given and that decisions uh, are communicated uh, clearly to, to the public. It has been an important part of 
of our response over the past 12 months to have that uh, very uh, clear uh, communication of what we're asking people to do, and that will continue to be important over these next few weeks. Alec Rowley, to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the First Minister if you will get the Government to have a look at the Local Authority Fund? Uh, so you have organisations, uh, businesses like categories, categories, dog kennels, laundry services, commercial cleaners, driving instructors, who have all been able to take advantage of the Local Authority Discretionary Fund that the Government have put in place. I spoke with Fife Council this morning and they tell me that the pressure on those funds is, is incredible and is likely to run out. So would the Government have a look at that uh, and see if additional funding can be put in place? First uh, we keep all of these things under ongoing review. In fact, the Local Authority Discretionary Fund has already been increased since we first established it. Uh, money uh, is obviously constrained. Uh, the funding we have is uh, not unlimited, but we look on an ongoing basis at where there is the greatest need for funding, and certainly uh, some of the categories that Alec Rowley has outlined uh, undoubtedly have that need. So we will keep that under ongoing review. Thank you very much. Christine Graham to be followed by Graham Simpson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Given that there are well publicised issues about vaccine supplies, particularly in April, what assurance can the First Minister give to those awaiting their second vaccination that they will receive it within the 12 weeks of that first vaccination? First Minister. I can give an assurance that people will receive their second dose within the 12 week window because of the in uh, fact that we will have, as I said last week, around uh, 500,000 fewer doses over uh, the next four weeks than we had originally anticipated. There will be a period as we go into April when we are predominantly focusing on second doses. So the, the numbers of first doses uh, are likely to reduce as a result to make sure that people get their second dose on time. But, and this is an important uh, assurance as well, uh, we still expect to be able to offer first doses to everybody in the GCVI categories one to nine by mid-April as we had uh, previously anticipated. Graeme Simpson to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you. Um, I was talking to members of Unite the Union yesterday representing the taxi trade. Taxi drivers have had some help during the pandemic, but in no way does it cover their costs, and many are just desperate. Forty per cent have had little or no support at all. Unite are asking for two things. The first is a scheme to help operators, and the second is something to help all taxi drivers. That could be an extra grant from what's left of the 57 million announced in January. So will the First Minister agree to look at their requests to ensure that we get a fair deal for cabbies? First Minister. Uh, we always look at requests made by trade unions or other organisations, so uh, I'm sure we uh, are already doing that. If not, we will do that. Um, the support that we've made available, whether it's to taxi drivers or any other uh, affected part of the economy, is not and never uh, was going to be able to compensate for all losses. Uh, we are seeking to do as much as possible, and that will continue to be the case for as long as is necessary. Thank you. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Colin Smith. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, I listened to your response to Alistair Allen regarding island authorities. I've been contacted by Aaron Businesses Keen for community and economic reasons for the island to stay within mainland Scotland's rules and guidelines. Current messaging regarding the timetable for easing restrictions states, and I quote, that travel within mainland Scotland is not allowed. Can the First Minister confirm that from the 2nd of April, non-essential travel within local authorities applies to Arran? Calmac will be informed that there are no travel restrictions within North Ayrshire and that from 26 of April, all conditions related to mainland Scotland will apply to Arran. The tourist economy depends on it. First Minister. Uh, yes, I, I, I understand and appreciate the, the point that Kenny Gibson is making, and uh, we certainly uh, take that very seriously. As I said to Alistair Allen, we have given a commitment to have discussions with our island communities about how best uh, we ensure that the restrictions keep them safe from the virus and allow uh, maximum benefit as we open up the economy. And I absolutely appreciate the point that's been made about making sure Aaron is in the same level of restrictions so that there can be that freedom of movement and travel. And if that is uh, the view of communities like Aaron, then and that is certainly uh, the view that we will uh, take as we come out of lockdown. Thank you. Colin Smith to be followed by...
Claire Adamson. Thank you, President Officer. The Scottish Government's strategic framework is silent on the important issue for my South Scotland constituents of cross-border travel and its timetable for easing restrictions, as was the First Minister today. So can the First Minister give my border constituents an insurance that the criteria she will use to decide whether cross-border travel can resume from the 26th of April will be the same criteria she has been using to determine that cross-Scotland travel is likely to be allowed from that date? There would be, I have to say, understandable anger if politicians can travel the length of Scotland next month for an election if families in Gretna can't travel a mile to safely visit a loved one in Cumbria, even outside, unless there is very good reason for that. First Minister. I would hope all politicians are really responsible in what they choose to do over uh, the next few weeks. Um, but if I can point out to Colin to the member that I was not silent about cross-border travel. I stood here last week and said that we hoped to ease the restrictions in cross-border travel on the 26th of April, but because of the different factors we have to take into account, we would finally confirm that uh, during April. And if we didn't do it on the 26th of April, we would do it as soon as possible after that. Obviously, or I think it's obvious, uh, those decisions depend, yes, on prevalence and incidence of the virus within Scotland, but they have to take account of prevalence and incidence of the virus in other parts of the UK as well. These are not straightforward decisions. If they were straightforward decisions, then you know we would just take them and be done with it. We're trying to keep people as safe as possible from a virus. I have no interest in, uh, without good reason, stopping people travel to see their loved ones within Scotland or in other parts of the UK. This is about trying to continue to suppress a virus as we vaccinate more people so that we don't have, uh, to, to the extent that we can avoid it, more and more and more people dying from this virus as we had over the past 12 months. And I would ask everybody uh, to remember that, to be as patient as possible, and I would ask politicians to continue to lead by example. Claire Adamson, to be followed by John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Many of my constituents in Motherwell and Wisha will be carrying out vital roles as unpaid carers in supporting vulnerable friends, neighbours and family members. Can I ask the First Minister of Scottish Government is promoting information around vaccines for unpaid carers so that people who may not have realised they're eligible are encouraged to come forward, and also those who may not have identified as unpaid carers, as they may also be eligible to come forward or vaccine. First Minister, did you get enough of that to answer? Do you want me to ask? <laughs> We will soon see whether I got enough of it to answer when uh, we, we determine whether the answer bears any relationship to the question. Um, I think uh, Claire Adamson was asking about uh, unpaid carers and their access to vaccination and uh, what we're doing to try to promote uh, take-up. Uh, we launched on, uh, I think, the 15th of March uh, the system for unpaid carers to register to receive the vaccine, uh, and we're currently running a national marketing campaign, mainly via digital channels, uh, press uh, and radio uh, to make sure unpaid carers are aware of, of that and what they need to do. All carers in touch with local carer services have also been contacted to encourage them to register and national carer organisations have also contacted carers on their list. Carers are able to self-register either online or through the national helpline and while carers identified through GP and social security data have already received a letter uh, with their vaccination appointment, others can access the helpline. So, Hopefully that answers uh, Claire Adamson's question, uh, but if there was any parts of it that I didn't hear so have not answered, uh, she can write to me later on and I'll make sure an answer is provided. Thank you very much. John Scott to be followed by Stuart McWillan. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the First Minister is aware of the continuing anxieties and tensions within our communities resulting from vaccination anxiety, the worry about appointments, delay for other illnesses and the lack of contact with friends and loved ones. Mental health issues are emerging and will continue to grow inevitably for some time yet. Uh, social work services and other third, third sector agencies will be at the front line in dealing with this growing problem. Does the First Minister have any plans, or more importantly, budgets, to further support the growing workload of these agencies? And if so, what are they, please? First Minister. Um, I, I know 
with the greatest of respect, the Conservatives didn't vote for the budget that we passed in this Parliament just a couple of weeks ago. But if John Scott cares to go and uh, read it, he will see uh, that there are plans to continue to support through uh, budgetary provision. And uh, indeed, this will apply in a whole range of other ways, those organisations that are working on the front line. Um, that is important uh, to do from a, a monetary point of view. Uh, but of course, all of us owe these organisations a great uh, debt of gratitude for the ways in which they have supported communities across the country uh, each and every day of the past 12 months. And this government will continue to do everything we can to support them in every way possible. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Thank you very much, President Officer. Access to the internet and digital services has been crucial in keeping family, friends and colleagues connected over the past year. However, the introduction of the crucial measures to control the spread of the virus also shone a light on the digital divide and the Scottish Government's investment in digital inclusion was therefore welcome. Can the First Minister provide an update on support that the Connecting Scotland programme has provided to date and what plans does the Scottish Government have to enable more people to get online? First Minister. The Connecting Scotland programme was set up specifically in response to the pandemic. It was intended to provide uh, digital devices, data, training and support uh, to those who need it most to get online. Uh, we initially planned to provide 9,000 people uh, at clinical risk from COVID with a device uh, and a connection to get online. Uh, but those plans uh, have significantly scaled up since then. And I'm pleased to say that over the past year, we have now delivered over 35,000 devices to people at clinical risk of COVID, uh, families with children uh, and isolated older and disabled people. And the third stage uh, of this programme has now started and is backed uh, by over £48 million and is intended to support 60,000 households to get online by the end of this year. Thank you. Mark Ruskell to be followed by Miles Briggs. Thank you. Some people will have been faced with impossible choices during this pandemic, such as a decision to go to work to earn enough money to eat, or to stay at home and self-isolate. Can the First Minister ensure that any gaps in the safety net that some will inevitably have slipped through in the last 12 months will be looked at and that we emerge from this with the strongest level of wraparound support for all people in Scotland? First Minister. I mean, I appreciate the sentiment behind that question and I agree with it. It is a, a, quite a generic question to ask me. I'd, hesitate to stand here and say that I can give a guarantee that nobody will, will slip uh, through the cracks. What we are trying to do is make sure that as far as we have the ability to do so within our resources, uh, we don't have people in the position of having to make invidious choices between going to work or self-isolating and protecting others. We've obviously established the self-isolation support grant. We've extended the eligibility for that. Mark Ruskell has rightly uh, raised legitimate questions about whether we can go further. We've taken another, a number of other steps to get money into the pockets of those who need it most. So there's a, a huge amount that has been done and that we will continue to do. But I readily acknowledge that we have work yet to do, both to protect people from the immediate impacts of this virus, but as we come out of it, uh, reorder and uh, redesign how we provide support to the most vulnerable so that we lift people out of poverty and avoid those kind of invidious choices that Mark Ruskell has outlined. Thank you. And Miles Briggs. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I've raised this issue a number of times with the First Minister, but I wanted to ask again today in terms of one of the most depressing things throughout this uh, pandemic, and that is families finding out that a power of attorney has been overruled, or in fact, uh, loved ones also finding the do not resuscitate form has not been given consent. Can I ask the First Minister what investigation has taken place over the course of this pandemic into this issue? And having met with families yesterday, will she today agree to an independent um, investigation into these so that we can see what's happened throughout this pandemic? First Minister. I will uh, certainly consider uh, any investigation that is considered necessary if, if there are aspects of a response to this pandemic that need to be looked at. I think the best way of doing this overall, although there may be other uh, more discreet uh, areas of investigation that we want to pursue, but the best way overall of doing this is through the statutory public inquiry that we have already committed to. Um, I've addressed the issue of uh, do not resuscitate um, on many occasions in the Chamber is a really important issue. Uh, we have taken steps through our clinical advisors to reiterate some of the, the guidance and messages to frontline clinicians. Nobody uh, and no family should be under any pressure to sign a DNR um, authority uh, that they have not fully understood or that they are not absolutely in, an, in agreement to. And I know that clinicians uh, would not want to be in that position. So any 
a uh, member who has concerns being raised at them should convey those to us so that if there are issues we need to address, then we are able uh, to do so because we are certainly very keen and willing to do so. Thank you very much, colleagues. And that concludes our statement on COVID-19 reflections and next steps. Uh, any members that need to leave or come into the chamber, please follow the one-way systems and make sure you wear your masks and follow the uh, social distance rules. The next item of business is topical questions. And our first question today is from Ian Gray, who joins us remotely. Ian Gray. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had regarding planned industrial action by college staff this week. Thank you. Minister Richard Lockhead. My most recent discussions were with College of Scotland yesterday to discuss the latest round of negotiations which are taking place as we speak. My officials have been in regular contact with them also to ensure I have been kept up to date with all these negotiations. I understand that as part of these discussions, the EIS FILA union has accepted that there is no national plan to replace lecturers with tutors, assessors or instructor roles, nor any other support staff roles. And I would therefore encourage both the employers and unions to continue with the current negotiations in an attempt to resolve this situation without the need for industrial action, which is absolutely not in the best interests of our learners, especially at this time against the backdrop of the pandemic. Thank you. Ian Gray. Indeed, with students trying to maintain their studies in spite of the pandemic, Clearly, strike action in colleges is undesirable, and in this case, it is unnecessary. Equally, this is no time to attack the terms and conditions. College staff, the fact is that over a week ago, the National Joint Negoti Negotiating Committee agreed the principle that there is no national plan to replace lecturers with instructor-type posts doing the same job, and then EIS fell out of the trade union, ratified this agreement in its national executive and suspended action. But College of Scotland refused to do so, even although the agreement was based on an employer side proposal. This just seems a matter of bad faith. Will the first min will the minister intervene now and ask College Scotland to stand by their own words, ratify the agreement they made, and stop the need for strike action? Minister. Uh, as Ian Gray knows, this is a matter to be resolved between the employers and the trade unions. And much progress has been made over the last few weeks and months with the joint statement, which you're aware of, I'm sure, where, as I said in my opening answer, they have agreed there is no national plan to replace lecturers with these other roles. However, as part of that statement, clearly there was disagreement over a separate part in relation to the responsibilities that make up the definition of a lecturer. As the negotiations are ongoing, I do hope they make constructive progress today, which will lead to an agreement and therefore calling off the strike that is planned for later this week, which, as I think we all agree and Ian Gray has agree agreed with, uh, is unnecessary and also is not in the interest of learners at this time against the backdrop of the pandemic. Ian Gray. Uh, I appreciate the, the Minister's desire to avoid strike action, but the fact of the matter is an agreement on all points was reached in the negotiating committee. The trade union side have ratified that agreement it is the employer side who have reneged on it and refused to ratify it. Does the minister not think that he really should beat College of Scotland, uh, ensure that they ratify the agreement they made, and end college staff's fear of an attack on terms and conditions, and they need to strike? Minister. Um, as I explained to, to Ian Gray, I, I did speak to College of Scotland indeed just uh, yesterday evening about this and encouraging College of Scotland, as indeed I encourage the trade union, to uh, reach an agreement and call off the strike action. These are staffing matters between the employer and the representatives of the employee. And of course, as Ian Gray says, the employer did not ratify the joint statement. And I do hope they can settle their differences at today's negotiations, which were taking place this morning, and then adjourned, and then reconvened this afternoon, in order that we can avoid strike action, which is in no one's interest, uh, and most of all, not in the interest of our learners. Jamie Green to be followed by Ross Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, whilst we all want to avoid the industrial action, we cannot ignore the fact that the sector has seen real terms funding cuts of £80 million since 2008, which clearly is forcing colleges to consider restructuring as cost-saving exercises. Can the Minister accept 
uh, that these cuts have put tremendous pressures on our college sector and that we must do everything we can now to support them in light of the vital role they will play in post-COVID recovery. Minister. <coughs> can I just say to Jamie Green that the college's budget has increased by 30 per cent since this government came into office in 2007 and indeed the most recent budget settlement it was actually welcomed by stakeholders plus the one-off COVID consequentials as well. But yes, things are tough for Fulham Higher Education at the moment, largely as a result as he's aware of the pandemic, and therefore that's another reason why hopefully both sides can reach an agreement today and call off strike action later this week. I'm sure they do want to do that, and I hope they'll just stay in the negotiating room today until they reach a settlement. Ross Greer. Thank you. Can I suggest to the Minister that strike action is in the interest of college lecturers if it saves their job, though of course no one wants it to come to that. This has essentially become an annual event where the union representing lecturers believe an agreement has been reached in good faith only for management to go back on it and the situation to have to escalate to industrial action or the threat thereof. Does the fact that this happens on an annual cycle not raise serious questions about college management's ability to negotiate in good faith? Minister. Um, Ross Greer may be interested in the latest statistics that were published today that shows that the number of full-time permanent college teaching staff with a recognised teaching qualification in Scotland's colleges actually increased by 2.1 percentage points uh, in the last year for which these figures are available. So there's actually an increase in the number of staff in our colleges with these uh, qualifications. I absolutely want both sides to reach an agreement today. That's in the interests of our colleges and employees and most of all of learners as well. We are talking, of course, about one particular dispute between one union and the college employers. And depending on the outcome of today's negotiations, that could indeed affect other unions uh, as well. So therefore, we have to pay close attention to this. I absolutely accept that. But the responsibility is between the employers and the employees to reach an agreement today. Thank you. Moving on to our second topical, Mark Ruskell. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how the regulation of Moss Moran Ethylene Plant will change following the independent review. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. As the member is aware, SEPA published the outcome of the Irish Environment Protection Agency peer review of its regulatory approach at Moss Moran on Friday 19th March. SEPA and indeed the Scottish Government is clear that compliance with Scotland's environmental laws is non-negotiable. SEPA has published a detailed response to all 20 recommendations made by the review, which covered technical site recommendations, regulatory approach, community liaison, communications, monitoring and modelling. And key recommendations which will be taken forward by SEPA include extending the environmental monitoring programme with community participation in its design, enhanced visibility of regulatory monitoring results and investment in a refreshed online community information hub. SEPA already has specialist staff involved in work at Moss Moran and in response to this peer review has committed to further strengthen regulation and monitoring across the forthcoming investment period at the site. Mark Roscoe. Thank you. After five years of highlighting the misery of communities living in the shadow of Moss Moran, can I welcome the progress that has now been made and also pay tribute to local campaigners who have kept the pressure on SEPA and the plant operators. Many of the 1,500 people who complained to SEPA last year did so because they couldn't sleep for days on end due to noise pollution. Will the Cabinet Secretary urge SEPA to set revised noise limits as part of the operator's permit and to expand noise monitoring in the community? First Minister. Well, I'm, I'm glad that Mark Ruskell considers there to have been uh, progress. I, I believe that there has been a very great uh, deal of progress. I uh, pointed to the 20 recommendations of that uh, independent uh, uh, evaluation. Uh, SEPA has already accepted eight. Nine are currently underway. That's nine more uh, are currently underway. One will be considered and two are not being taken forward. Uh, I think the, there is already specialist monitoring, compliance, enforcement and support staff involved in all work at Moss Moran. And in response to the peer review, SEPA has committed to further strengthening regulation and monitoring uh, across the investment period, as I indicated. Uh, so the, the issue that is raised by Mark Ruskell will be included in part of that consideration. Thank you very much, Mark Ruskell. Can I welcome that response? And, you know, while the regulatory improvements are welcome, Moss Moran still remains Scotland's third largest climate polluter, and it will be impossible for us to meet climate targets without serious and urgent action at the plant. Will the Scottish Government take the word of ExxonMobil, an organisation responsible for climate denial, when it comes to future plans for Moss Moran, or will the Government itself lead the discussion with the operators and the community on what a just transition for the plant should look like? 
Cabinet Secretary. Well, there is a constant discussion both within government and between government and uh, a variety of different partners, uh, and, uh, uh, and that includes uh, um, sectors of the economy as to how this goes forward. We are tasking uh, individual companies to be looking very carefully at their own uh, proposals in respect of just transition and the same task is being uh, uh, suggested to ExxonMobil uh, with whom I have had uh, recent correspondence um, as the member is aware. So just transition is an absolutely vital part uh, of what we do in terms of taking forward the work that we need to do over the next 10 years to get to our interim targets and Moss Morin as well will be very much a part of that just transition discussion. Thank you. Annabel Ewing to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Irish EPA's recommendations on enhanced air quality monitoring and wider community engagement are very welcome indeed. And in fact, are matters I have been calling for for many years. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that these recommendations will be implemented at pace? And can the Cabinet Secretary also confirm that the Scottish Government will make it quite clear to the operators of the site that the flaring, which is apparently to result from the need to shut down the plant in the weeks ahead to go ahead with upgrade work, that that flaring will be kept to the bare minimum to ensure that the least disruption to affected communities is caused. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. I know this is an issue that the member has been closely involved with for some time, and I uh, do value her constructive engagement on the matter. Of the 20 recommendations from the peer review, as I've indicated, nine are already underway and a further eight have been accepted by SEPA. Those already being taken forward do include recommendations relating specifically to air quality monitoring and community engagement. SEPA is finalising a project plan to take forward implementation of the other recommendations, uh, including work around communications monitoring of volatile organic compounds and modelling. On flaring, uh, SEPA has been very clear that this was unacceptable and must become the exception rather than the routine. And the Scottish Government has and will continue to impress upon the operators the need to minimise disruptive flaring during the forthcoming shutdown and restart process. Uh, the forthcoming £140 million investment in the site should improve reliability. Unplanned elevated flaring and its associated impact on the local community should become a less frequent occurrence and when flaring is required, its impact should be reduced. And this is the basis on which we are having conversations with ExxonMobil. And Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. SEPA have indicated that the plant now has a clear pathway to compliance. But the community is still sceptical after years of disruption and misery caused by failures and flaring. Therefore, what assurances can the Cabinet Secretary give to local residents when SEPA have rejected proposals to install a suitably qualified and experienced expert at the site to ensure compliance and monitoring progress on the day-to-day -day installation of the new low-noise flare tip? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I think uh, um, uh, Alexander Stewart is uh, referring to one of the two recommendations that SEPA is not taking forward, uh, and that the, the, the one is in relation to having a dedicated site agent. Um, uh, uh, and uh, the, the fact is that SEPA already dedicates significant resources to Moss Moran, more than to any other single regulated site uh, in Scotland. SEPA also gains additional expertise by working with partners such as HSE and by bringing in specialist technical expertise if or when needed. The site agent recommendation um, isn't being pursued. While SEPA can see that there may be benefit in deploying a site agent at other types of sites, SEPA don't consider it would add value to Moss Morin. Uh, and SEPA currently reviews permits in line with the process set out in the Pollution Prevention and Control Scotland Regulations 2012. They'll assess its supporting guidance to ensure it is clear what criteria it uses to decide when a permit review is required. But at this point, it does not consider a dedicated site agent is a necessary or appropriate response. Thank you very much. And that concludes topical questions. Uh, before we move on to the next item of business, could you just encourage all members, if uh, the guidance is to use or to remain in the same seat if you're coming in out of the chamber, if you do change seats, please use the wipes available to wipe down the uh, desk and chair beforehand. We're going to move on now to the next item of business. This is a debate on motion 24292 in the name of Ruth Davidson, 
on a motion of no confidence. I would encourage all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons. And members should note that I will call the question on the motion immediately following the conclusion of the debate. Can I call Ruth Davidson? Thank you. Presiding officer, we're here today because a former First Minister was accused of sexually harassing members of staff in the government that he was there not only to lead but to serve. We're here because the hastily changed policy designed to protect staff from such actions was not fit for purpose and was implemented in an unfair and unlawful way. We are here because the Scottish Government, when subject to judicial review of the cluster burich that had occurred, sought to frustrate the court, embarrass their own lawyers and attempted to defend the indefensible, costing the taxpayer over half a million pounds in the process. Nobody, nobody comes out of this well, apart from the original complainants and the external counsel to the Scottish Government. And nobody, nobody has taken responsibility for the multiple failings at every level which occurred. Getting to today has been a process years in the making. And let's remember the promises that were made. I now intend fully as the First Minister to respect the work of the various investigations that have been established. The words of Nicola Sturgeon spoken from the place in which she is now sitting on the 17th of January 2019. And I took her at her word. A committee of the Scottish Parliament had been established to consider and report on the actions of the First Minister, of government officials and of special advisers over the botched investigation. That committee would take evidence, deliberate and deliver a judgment. Indeed, the First Minister demanded of members of this chamber the same high standards that she claimed for herself. She said, it strikes me that people cannot call for inquiries and then refuse to respect the work of those inquiries. I will respect the work of those inquiries and the question is, will others across the chamber? It was a fundamental question, to which at the time there seemed a pretty self-evident answer. What member of this parliament would not respect and accept the verdict of a committee of this parliament established to investigate such serious matters? But now the verdict is in and we have our answer to that fundamental question. And those who have traduced the committee, who have rubbished its work, who have thrown mud at its members, who have made baseless claims regarding its outcomes and have disrespected its conclusions, are the members that are sitting behind the First Minister and who are catcalling from a sedentary position at the Order, moment. Please. Yesterday, we publicly accepted the Hamilton report. For days, others have rejected the committees. And we note that Hamilton was crystal clear that the basis of this vote of no confidence, whether the First Minister misled this Parliament or not, is a decision for this Parliament and not for him. So let's look at the committee's conclusions. In its 192 pages, the report directly concludes that the First Minister misled the Parliamentary Committee regarding her initial meeting with Alex Salmond in her house in April 2018. We already know that her original statement, that this meeting was the first that she had heard of any such complaints, was also misleading. And once after she falsely stated that to Parliament, she was forced to correct the record. The Committee also concluded that the catastrophic failure to disclose documents through the judicial review process was the reason for the high awarding of costs and the wasting of taxpayers' money, saying those responsible should be held accountable. Similar to the judicial review, the committee was directly thwarted in its attempts to gather evidence and its verdict was scalding. This is an unacceptable position for a parliamentary committee to find itself in when trying to scrutinise the government, particularly when both the First Minister and the Permanent Secretary stated that there would be full cooperation with the inquiry and how hollow that full cooperation pledge now looks. But the most difficult bit to read of this whole report for all of us, and I expect for the First Minister too, are the words of the original complainers themselves who were badly let down, who talked of working in a culture where bad behaviour was endemic and such behaviour was permitted and a blind eye was turned to it. A charge that was substantiated by the civil service union, the FDA, who said that its members working for the Scottish Government operated in a culture of fear and the issues are not historical they are current. No matter what your political colours, it should shame us all that working for your country's government, which should be a matter of pride, is actually a test of strength because of unacceptable behaviour and blind eyes being turned. And on the subject of behaviour, I want to put on record that I believe the leaking of this report's findings last week was both damaging and wrong, and I, along with my party, will support any investigation into that wrongdoing. <laughs> Presiding officer, 
The First Minister proclaimed her respect for the work of this Parliament's Committee of Inquiry. Right up until the moment it became clear that the outcome would not suit her. Then her respect for it vanished. And I don't doubt that if this committee report had cleared her of wrongdoing, it would be held up as being the will of this Parliament. But a report which found her to have misled this Parliament is instead denounced as an unprincipled hatchet job. I have already said that I respect the Hamilton report's conclusions, but he publicly and specifically handed the question of whether the First Minister misled this Parliament back to the Parliament itself. And let's be clear about what the committee inquiry of this Parliament has found. After taking months of evidence from dozens of witnesses, even including the First Minister's eight hours of testimony, after all of that evidence gathering and deliberation, the committee found that Nicola Sturgeon misled this Parliament. And nothing can erase that fact, however inconvenient it is to the First Minister and to her supporters. And let's remember that by misleading this Scottish Parliament, she misled the people of Scotland too. No First Minister who truly wanted to live up to the ideals of this Parliament should feel able to continue in post after having been judged guilty of misleading it. How can Parliament have confidence in the words of a First Minister whose words have been found to be false? The honourable thing would be to resign. Whether the First Minister has that sense of honour is now between her and her conscience. I move the motion in my name. Thank you. And I call on the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon. Presiding officer, uh, wisdom, justice, compassion, integrity. Uh, those are the values inscribed in our mace and each and every single one of us has a duty to uphold them. So before I address my position, let me say this. There are some in this chamber who decided before a single word of evidence had been heard that I was guilty in relation to the handling of complaints against the former First Minister. The only question was what they would choose to find me guilty of. In recent months, I've faced accusations of conspiracy against, collusion with and cover up on behalf of Alex Salmond. None of that is supported by evidence because none of that is true. But for some, as I think this Tory motion makes clear, getting to the facts, learning lessons and helping ensure that women are not let down in future were always secondary considerations to the desperate attempt to claim my political scalp. Nevertheless, presiding officer, the committee's work was important and I give an assurance today that the government will study its report closely and take its recommendations very seriously. The mistake made by the government in the investigation of the complaints against Alex Salmond, albeit a mistake made in the course of trying to do the right thing, was serious, as were the consequences of it. And once again, I want to apologise unreservedly to the women who were let down as a result of that. It will be a priority of mine for as long as I am First Minister to ensure that lessons are learned and that trust is re-established so that anyone in future who considers that they have suffered sexual harassment has the confidence to come forward and know that their concerns will be listened to and addressed. Turning now, presiding officer, to my own position. As I said in evidence to the committee, I may not have got everything right in my handling of this situation. The situation I was confronted with was extremely difficult, politically certainly, but also personally. I accept and respect that some people faced with the same situation may have made different decisions. But I am clear in my mind that I acted appropriately and that I made the right judgments overall and I reject entirely any suggestion of misleading this parliament. Now for me, being at peace with my own conscience as I am on these matters is a necessary condition of being able to continue as First Minister. But I know that that is not sufficient. No politician can be her own judge and jury. The public deserved independent verification that I had not breached the standards that I am expected to uphold. And yesterday they got that assurance from James Hamilton's report. Mr Hamilton considered all of the issues that were alleged to amount to a breach of the Ministerial Code, including the question of whether I misled Parliament. And this is what he concluded. I am of the opinion that the First Minister did not breach the provisions of the Ministerial Code in respect of any, any of these matters. In advance of yesterday's report, all parties spoke of the need to respect Mr Hamilton's conclusions. Indeed, the report of the committee itself says this. James Hamilton's report is the most appropriate place to address the question of whether or not the First Minister has breached the Ministerial Code. 
Presenting officer, let me be clear about this. Had Mr Hamilton's report gone the other way, I would have accepted it. Had he found that I had breached the code in anything other than the most technical and immaterial of ways, I would have been standing here right now tendering my resignation. Because the integrity of the office I am so privileged to hold really does matter to me. The office of First Minister is more important than any temporary incumbent of it. But given that I have been cleared by that independent report of any breach of the ministerial code, uh, then my message to all those, especially to the Conservatives, who now, despite Ruth Davidson's protestations, refuse to accept Mr Hamilton's conclusions, is this. If you think you can bully me out of office, you are mistaken and you misjudge me. If you want to remove me as First Minister, do it in an election. Yeah. Of course... <laughs> if today's desperate political stunt proves anything, it is that you have no confidence whatsoever in your ability to do so because you have nothing positive to offer the Scottish people. Presiding officer, the last year has been exhausting for everyone. My experience of it is as nothing compared to those who have lost loved ones, suffered illness or watched businesses go to the wall. But I have given my all every single day trying to lead us through this ordeal. I, I don't mind admitting that the intensity and the gravity of decision making has taken its toll. The Alex Salmon saga and the assault on my character that it has entailed has certainly not helped. But this country needs strong, experienced and positive leadership as we continue to navigate our way through and out of this crisis. And, presiding officer, that is what I offer. Which takes me to my final and to my most fundamental point. Tomorrow, this parliamentary term reaches its conclusion perhaps not a moment too soon. The toxic atmosphere that has infected this chamber in recent months will give way, I hope, to the fresh air of an election. And I hope that the fresh air will bring with it a rigorous and positive debate, not just about personalities, but about the kind of country we want to be, about how we rebuild from this pandemic and create a fairer, more prosperous Scotland. It is now time, presiding officer, for the country to decide. The confidence of this parliament matters. Of course it does. But it is the confidence of the people of Scotland that matters most. And that, the confidence of the people, is what I will seek to demonstrate and seek to win in the weeks that lie ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Can I call on Anasawa? Presenting officer, earlier today we held a minute silent on the steps outside this chamber to remember all those who have lost their lives over the past year and all those grieving the loss of a loved one. On this, the penultimate day before the Parliament reaches the end of its five-year term, I would much rather we were reflecting on the impact of this dreadful pandemic and debating what we need to do to ensure our country recovers in the years ahead. Instead, we are confronted by a litany of government failings which led to two women being so badly let down, and a Tory party that cares not about the principles but about the politics. A harassment policy failed. Two women were let down. It has shaken trust in the system and risked discouraging victims to come forward. It has called into question the integrity of government. It has undermined the principles of transparency and accountability. It has seen a misuse of public money. There are huge failures and big questions to be answered. There are no winners in this debate. Not the SNP. The spectacle of using a harassment inquiry, a harassment inquiry, as a, re a recruiting tool was grotesque. And the Tories, in the face of all these failures, playing politics, interested only in getting a scalp. They announced they would bring a vote of no confidence before the First Minister had even given evidence to the committee. They lodged this motion on the 4th of March, before the Hamilton inquiry or the committee inquiry had concluded. Seriously, on one side, 
a litany of failings from a government that let down two women. On the other side, an opposition guilty of playing grubby party politics on an issue as serious as sexual harassment. This is a day of shame for our parliament. Scotland deserves a better government and it deserves a better opposition. From the outset, I have made it clear that we would not prejudice the outcome of the inquiries, that we would remove party and personality. I accept the conclusion of the report published yesterday, but I also accept the conclusions of the cross-party report published today by a committee of this parliament, which highlights a catalogue of errors. And yet still nobody has taken responsibility for the catastrophic failings by this government. There are still serious questions for the Permanent Secretary and for the First Minister too, because the buck ultimately stops with her. It cheapens this Parliament to have the government attacking the work of the committee. The SNP's tactics risk calling into question the very verdict of every committee of this Parliament ever. Members have spent months scrutinising and investigating in an attempt to get to the truth, often in the face of obstruction from the government. There are huge challenges ahead for our country, but I tell you, President Officer, we can't come back to a parliament like this after the 6th of May, using this chamber as a game designed to divide our country further. Earlier today, I lodged an amendment to this motion which recognised the gravity of the government's failures and demanded that someone takes responsibility, whilst also calling out the shameless blame paying by the Conservatives. That amendment was rejected. Do I have confidence in the way the First Minister, her team and senior members of the government have handled this matter? Thank you. Can I call on Willie Rennie? Scottish politics today does not look pretty. Talk of lynching, assassination, leaking the private evidence of complainants, tabling motions of no confidence before even all the evidence had been heard. Attacking a committee because it does not agree with the First Minister. Lauding the performance of Nicola Sturgeon because she talked to a committee for eight hours, as if the show is more important than the facts. Boasting about recruiting new members on the back of this tragedy. No one wins from this ugly episode. Not the First Minister, not Douglas Ross, and certainly not Alex Salmond who has been exposed for what he really is. Failed. The women who complained. When they stepped up, we were not there for them. In the committee report published today, one woman tells how she and her fellow complainer were dropped by the Scottish Government and left to swim. There are unresolved issues that I wish to explore today so we would have voted for the amendment in the name of Anas Sarwar if it had been selected. The Conservatives have shown themselves as only interested in removing Nicola Sturgeon from office rather than the facts of this terrible series of events. They have undermined the integrity of the independent investigator. Yet even the most ardent SNP supporter must recognise that the woman who complained were let down by the government and that half a million pounds was wasted defending the indefensible in court. We know the government will win today because they have the unconditional support of the Greens. But this debate and vote cannot be the end. So in his summing up, I would like the Deputy First Minister to tell us where this goes from here. First, how does he explain why James Hamilton was unable to conclude whether the First Minister misled Parliament over whether she offered to help Alex Salmond when they met in her home? James Hamilton says it is up to the Parliament to determine whether it has been misled on this. We need an adequate explanation from the Deputy First Minister. Second, on the transfer of the name of a complainant to Alex Salmond's former Chief of Staff. James Hamilton believes that did happen. He says that version of events is credible. That is a terrible breach of confidentiality. 
Not only were they left to swim, but their identity was passed to a person that they were complaining about. What is now to happen to the person responsible? Third, the government made a serious error in defending the indefensible in the court case costing half a million pounds and more. This is a colossal error that apparently no individual is responsible for. What will happen next? Finally, on the government's complaints process. Confidence is rock bottom now. No one has complained in the last three years. What will, what will the government do to convince this parliament and women that this process will change? The SNP is divided, has a terrible record of delivery over 14 years in government. And they are serious questions about how women were treated by this government. I would contest that they no longer should be in office. Even as the government wins today, the voters will have their say in seven weeks. The country deserves a positive, progressive alternative that will put recovery first. But how we will vote today will be determined by what answers we receive from the Deputy First Minister as he sums up today. Thank you. And can I call Patrick Harvey, who joins us remotely? Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This situation began with an extremely serious issue, the mishandling of an investigation into sexual harassment allegations. And I honestly wish that everyone's focus had remained on that issue. But what we have seen since then has been the deliberate, systematic and entirely cynical exploitation of that issue to suit motives which are all too apparent today. The media in Scotland and throughout the UK is awash with speculation about the sturgeon salmon psychodrama. The coverage of this is dominated by one question, what does this mean for the independence cause? when we should be asking what this means for the treatment of harassment or for the position of those who want to call it out. Sadly, we already know the answer to that question. Since the original committee leaks months ago, through multiple instances of MSPs on that committee prejudging the evidence, announcing their political motivations to the world, and then to the disgraceful betrayal of trust, the original complainers over the last weekend, what should have been a serious inquiry has descended into farce. I believe this is the deliberate choice of those who have nothing to offer the people of Scotland. They looked at the devolved institutions and saw a high level of public trust in them and could not bear it. And they set about trying to drag everything down to their level. They will fail. But as a direct result of their actions, the women who complained about sexual harassment in the first place had to put out a statement via Rape Crisis Scotland to complain about the violation of their trust. So here we are. In one hand, we have an independent report by someone with enough professionalism not to go hawking quotes to the press in advance. It clears the First Minister of any breach of the ministerial code. And in the other hand, we have a report by a committee of this parliament whose members have prejudged the evidence, called for resignations before listening to it, betrayed the original complainers in the sexual harassment case and leaked their own conclusions to the media. Their actions are a betrayal of the trust we all placed in them when we appointed this committee. Calling out this behaviour does not, as Anna Sarwar suggests, reflect on the rest of our parliament. Our parliament is better than this but they have clearly destroyed the credibility of their own work and advertised their partisan motivations for all to see. And far worse than that, they have sent a chilling message to anyone else considering complaining about harassment by powerful men, that if they do so, their lives can be turned into tawdry political theatre for months or even years. The only resignations I have any interest in debating today are those of the committee members who have so systematically broken our rules, abused the trust of witnesses and played childish games with the serious issue they were asked to examine. They are the ones who should be resigning today. And any political party that wants to come out of this episode with a shred of credibility 
will do whatever it takes to identify the culprits and ensure that they are not able to stand for re-election in six weeks' time. They have shown contempt for the serious issue of sexual harassment. They have shown contempt for their witnesses. They have shown contempt for the rules of this Parliament. And having failed in their attempt to drag Scottish politics down to their level, they should just go. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Harvey. Can I call Alistair Allen, who joins us remotely. Alistair Allen. Presiding Officer, James Hamilton's independent investigation has now finally reported. It has unambiguously cleared the First Minister of all the charges that she had breached the ministerial code. Those very accusations were, of course, what today's flimsy motion of no confidence was seemingly built on. And judging by what I've heard so far, they are the dead horse which the Tories look determined to flog. It is worth collectively reminding ourselves, though, that this whole unhappy story isn't ultimately about politics. It's not about the conspiracy theories that grip the political and media worlds and which at one fever point encompass everyone in Scotland from the First Minister to SNP staff to the complainers to the civil service, the prosecutors and even, improbably enough, to the Lord Advocate. In case we forget, this is ultimately the much simpler, sadder story of two women, two real human beings, who made complaints. The Scottish Government's own complaints procedures, as we all now know, completely failed them. So too, it gives me no pleasure to say, did some of the officials who were tasked with operating those procedures. For my many sins, Presiding Officer, I have served these last two years on this Parliament's Committee of Inquiry into the handling of those complaints. Like a number of other committee members, I decided many months ago not to give a breathless running commentary to the media about our evidence and private deliberations. And to say that our committee leaked like the Titanic would be to do a considerable injustice to Harland and Wolfe. The Titanic only leaked the once. I can genuinely say that for me, the low point in my 14 years in this place was when I found out that someone on our committee had gone so far as to leak sensitive material purporting to be accounts of the two women, accounts which had in fact not been authorised by them for release. That presiding officer was in flagrant breach of every assurance the women had been given about the trust they could place in us. Now, some have said that such behaviour represents a challenge to the credibility of this parliament. Well, like Patrick Harvey, I profoundly disagree with that assessment. I think it's simply a challenge to the credibility of some members. But it does, I am afraid, speak to the deep reserves of disfiguring political hatred which some people in this place apparently have for the First Minister. A hatred born, no doubt, of long political frustration, and which brings them to their confidence motion today. Presiding Officer, there were, of course, many things in the committee's report on which we all agreed, and I hope those findings will be useful to prevent people being failed again in future. The unevidenced insinuations about the First Minister, which were tacked onto the end of our report, in the last day or two of our meetings, do not, I am afraid, fall into that category. In any case, Mr Hamilton's report demolishes the very basis for today's motion. The idea that the ministerial code was breached through failure to record meetings, the allegation that the First Minister may have attempted to influence the conduct of the investigation, or that she misled Parliament, or that she failed to comply with the law, are all rejected. So, presiding officer, as this Parliament draws to a close and this motion runs into the sand. What are the opposition left with? They are loathing aside, I mean. Well, they are left facing an election which it seems they have decided to make all about character. Presiding officer, after this week, I wish them good luck with that one. Thank you, Mr. Allen. And we'll turn now to closing speeches. Jackie Bailey to be followed by John Swinney. Jackie Bailey. I am proud to have been a member of the Scottish Parliament since its inception, just like the presiding officer 
and the First Minister, a member of the class of 99. But never in my 22 years here have I seen or imagined anything quite like this. Um, the fallout between the former First Minister and the current First Minister has laid bare the deep divisions in the SNP. It's laid bare the blurring of lines between the party and the government. And it has exposed the need for the Scottish Parliament, in my view, to have more powers to hold the government to account. I want to focus my comments on the committee report, but first let me say that the result of this vote of no confidence is a foregone conclusion. Um, I have to question the motivation of the Tories to have a vote of no confidence before James Hamilton had even reported, before they had seen the outcome of the committee's inquiry, is deeply irresponsible. The committee report published this morning details the catastrophic failings of the Scottish Government on a matter of the utmost seriousness and sensitivity. Despite the obstruction of the Scottish Government, and the obstruction was significant, the committee has managed to get beyond the veil of government secrecy. We must never forget, though, the two female civil servants who complained about harassment and who have been comprehensively failed by the Scottish Government. I welcome the First Minister's acknowledgement of this and apology for it. But three years on, no one, but no one has taken responsibility for this. There have been no resignations, no sackings, yet we all acknowledge that the failure was catastrophic. The harassment policy was rushed through without any specialist advice or input. The handling of complaints was fundamentally flawed with the appointment of an investigating officer that was not independent from the process. And the person who had oversight of all of this, who was involved in every aspect of the procedure, was the permanent secretary. And she must bear much of the responsibility. The Scottish Government still, still does not have a functioning harassment policy. So it is essential that the recommendations of the Laura Dunlop report are carried through urgently. And it's essential that the recommendations of the committee, the majority of which were unanimous, are carried forward too. The committee also felt that the Scottish Government's determination to plough on defending their position in the Court of Session when the prospects of success were minimal was irresponsible and cost the taxpayer in excess of £500,000. A majority also believed that the First Minister misled the committee about whether she would intervene following her meeting with Alex Salmond on the 2nd of April. Now, I know that this has been painted as a partisan decision, but let me say to you, one independent member, one Labour member, two Tories and one Lib Dem agreed after hearing the evidence. That's not partisan. But four SNP members, four SNP members who voted together were never, despite what they may have heard, were never going to vote to criticise the First Minister. There remain many serious questions that need to be answered that need to be answered about the First Minister's judgment, that need to be answered about the Scottish Government's handling of harassment complaints. But above all, we need to ensure that women coming forward to complain about harassment are not let down by the Scottish Government ever, ever again. And can I call John Swinney to be followed by Liz Smith. John Swinney. Presenting officer, it is my privilege to close this debate for the Government and to encourage Parliament to reject this baseless motion from the Conservatives. At the heart of this debate, as many members have talked about, are two women who had the bravery and the courage to complain about behaviour that was unacceptable. I say to Parliament honestly that they were let down by the Government. That has been acknowledged by the First Minister, by me on countless occasions, and we accept that criticism and we have apologised for it. But as Dr Alistair Allen has just said, those women were also very badly let down by somebody who was a member of this committee by leaking a misrepresentation of their evidence to a Sunday newspaper. That has added trauma upon trauma to these complainants. And whoever was responsible for that should consider the issues raised by Patrick Harvey in his contribution because they are unfit 
to be a member of this Parliament. The government, <laughs> the government accepts that mistakes were made, we apologise for them and we will remedy them. There is much in the committee report that was published this morning of substance which is of strong challenge to the procedures and processes of the government which the government must accept. It is good work that has been done there and as Jackie Bailey has just said, the overwhelming majority of it was delivered unanimously. The Laura Dunlop report that was uh, passed to the government last week, I have indicated publicly the government will take forward, along with the Harassment Committee inquiry report and that of Mr Hamilton, to make sure that action is taken speedily to address the issues that need to be addressed, to make sure we have in place a policy framework that is fit for purpose to enable anyone who has the need to complain to be able to complain and to complain with confidence. So those will be the actions of government and it will be for incoming ministers to take that forward after the 6th of May. We then turn to the substance of this motion and whether it is an appropriate motion for this parliament to consider. On the 2nd of March, Douglas Ross MP said this, there is no longer any doubt that Nicola Sturgeon lied to the Scottish Parliament and broke the ministerial code on numerous counts. That was the day before the First Minister gave eight hours of testimony, before she had said a word to the Parliamentary Committee. Yeah. On the same day, Adam Tompkins, a member of this Parliament, tweeted this. Sturgeon lied. We know that now. That's why she must resign. She lied. Ruth Davidson talked about high standards. I have to say, I find that tweet the lowest standard I have ever seen in my parliamentary life. My dear friend, the First Minister, talked about the toxic culture. If there was a toxic culture anywhere, Adam Tompkins emptied a, 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 a gallon of petrol on that toxic yeah. culture by a remark of that type. Jackie Bailey talked a moment ago about how the committee was a, a, a dispassionate conclusion was arrived at by the, uh, the votes of two Conservatives, one Labour, one Liberal and one Independent member. On the 12th of October 2020, Murdo Fraser tweeted, the FM lied again. How on earth can we be expected to take seriously conclusions arrived at by five votes to four at the last, last gasp of the committee processes when the committee had already agreed to these words. For all these reasons, the committee believes that James Hamilton report is the most appropriate place to address the question of whether or not the First Minister has breached the Scottish Ministerial Code. And yesterday, Mr Hamilton gave his verdict, I am of the opinion that the First Minister did not breach the provisions of the Ministerial Code in respect of any of these matters. So the First Minister, on the committee's test, was exonerated yesterday by Mr Hamilton, and I am delighted that that has been the case. I have sat in close quarters to the First Minister for many years. As colleagues, eh, sometimes in um, active disagreement about priorities, most of them, respectfully, First Minister, about money, if I <laughs> seem to remember. But throughout all of my days of dealing with the First Minister, I've always known I was dealing with an individual of integrity, yeah. of character, of responsibility and of devotion. Devotion to serving the people of this country. She has given every ounce of her energy to protect the people of this country in the last trying 12 months over COVID. She has done everything she could to protect the public. And the last thing she deserves is this grubby motion from the Conservatives. And I invite Parliament to chuck it out at the first available opportunity. Thank you, Mr Swinney. And can I ask Liz Smith to wind up our debate? Uh, thank you. Tomorrow, presiding officer, every seat in this Parliament becomes vacant again. And all business in the chamber comes to an end, after which we await the verdict of the voters on the 6th of May, just six weeks away. And as the First Minister said, that is as it should be. But I hope the newly elected members on the 6th of May will learn some very important lessons about what this whole sorry saga has meant for Scottish politics. And I also hope these lessons will be learnt by every single politician, irrespective of his or her political views or seniority, 
starting with the fact that the female complainants in this case have been utterly failed by the serious flaws in the Scottish Government's handling of the complaints process. But that is not all. Because the fallout from both James Hamilton's report and from the Parliamentary Committee investigating the Scottish Government's handling of the complaints process is significant, and it is certain to have long-term ramifications. The First Minister has been cleared of breaking the ministerial code, but she has not been cleared of a serious lack of judgment, of presiding over a dysfunctional government, and crucially, and crucially of misleading the committee, most especially when it comes to her account of when she first heard about the concerns of Alex Salmond. Neither should we ignore the fact that James Hamilton makes clear that he was frustrated by the fact that legal constraints prevented him from publishing all the relevant details without redaction so that the necessary evidence could be examined in the appropriate context. Presiding officer, when political commentaries are written these days, it is often said I won't, Mr Swinney. It is often said that politicians have sunk low in people's esteem, that there is a diminished level of integrity in politics and therefore a diminished level of trust between the voter and the body politic. Presiding officer, I agree with that. And that, for me, is what has happened in this case because it is symptomatic of the problem. Because at times there has been a complete disregard for the will of Parliament. How many times in recent months have we seen the Scottish Government completely ignore the outcome of votes in this chamber? We have seen a government determined to override the democratic process, believing that it knows better than Parliament. Indeed, that is the main difference that I see in my 14 years in Holyrood. Government is now dominant over Parliament rather than the other way round, and that is not healthy for democracy. And in that context, and in that context, Mr Swinney, if you're going to yes, make please, Mr. Comments, I would be grateful if you could just listen to the next point. Because I hope that the First Minister will reflect on the findings of James Hamilton when he says, and I quote, although I accept the First Minister's statement that her motivation to agreeing to the meeting was personal and political, and she may have sought to underscore this by hosting it in her private home and with no permanent civil servant present and no expenditure of public money, it could not, in my opinion, be characterised as a party meeting. That speaks volumes about the difference between party and government and how we should operate. In a further section in James Hamilton's report, he raises concerns that the claim that one of our officials leaked the name of the complainer is credible. And that must ring alarm bells too. And then there is the vast sum of taxpayers' money spent on a legal case that the First Minister knew was fundamentally flawed. Yep. Presiding officer, this whole issue has principally raised questions about the operations of the First Minister and the Scottish Government, yep. but it has also raised questions about the effectiveness of Holyrood. And to those ministers who in recent weeks have been trying to pretend that this Parliament is above reproach, I say no, it is not. I do not subscribe to the view that Holyrood is broken, but if it is to restore its reputation, it has a lot to think about in the next parliament, led by the next presiding officer, whoever he or she may be. It needs to address the concerns about the inbuilt political bias of the committee system, about the relationship between government and other important bodies, including the Crown, yep. about the absence of parliamentary privilege and the need to scrutinise post-legislative matters, given the absence of a revising chamber. And so we fully support the committee's recommendation that there should be a commission to review the relationship between the executive and the legislator and make recommendations for change. Presiding officer, I return to my earlier remark that this is all about women who were failed by the Scottish Government. But it's also about the failed workings of government, of the First Minister and her senior officials, and the weakened scrutiny of Parliament, which resulted from obfuscation, from a lack of transparency, and incomplete information provided by the Scottish Government. I would suggest that no one comes out of this well, but principally the First Minister, who, although she is cleared of breaking the ministerial code, she has been found guilty of so many other failings which have undermined the integrity of this whole political process. What the person out there in the real world can see is that staff have been bullied, 
evidence has been withheld, stories don't add up, and women complainants have been badly let down. And so when the political history of 2021 comes to be written, people will rightly ask, why has no one resigned? Thank you very much, Ms Smith. And that concludes our debate on a motion of no confidence. We're going to go straight to the vote. The question is, that motion 24292, in the name of Ruth Davidson, on a motion of no confidence, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No! We're not agreed. We're going to suspend for five minutes to allow members to access the voting app, members in the chamber and members on the virtual chamber. Parliament is suspended for five minutes.
Thank you, colleagues. We are now back in session, and we're going to move straight to the vote. The question is that motion 24292, in the name of Ruth Davidson, on a motion of no confidence, be agreed. Members should cast their votes now. This will be a one-minute division. A one-minute division. Thank you, colleagues. That vote is now closed. Please let me know if you were not able to vote. Can I call Gil Patterson to make a point of order? Gil Patterson to make a point of order. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. I was unable to access the app. I would have voted no. Thank you, Mr. Patterson. Your vote will be added to the vote. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. The result of the vote on motion 24292 in the name of Ruth Davidson is yes, 31, no, 65. There were 27 abstentions and the motion is therefore not agreed. Thank you, colleagues. We're going to move on now to the next item of business. I would remind all members who need to leave the chamber at this stage just to follow the one-way systems to wear their masks. Make sure that you observe social distancing rules. And if you are having to change desks, make sure they are wiped down. The next item of business is Stage 3 Proceedings on the European Charter of Local Self-Government and Corporation Scotland Bill. And in dealing with the amendments, members should have with them the bill as amended at Stage 2, the Marshall List and the grouping of amendments. I just remind members that the division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division on this bill and the period of voting for each division will be one minute. If a member wishes to speak in any of the groups, uh, just press your button as soon as I call the group and I will call your name. Thank you, colleagues. So we're going to turn now to Group 1. This is on the meaning and interpretation of the charge.